Hello everyone, my name is Patty Anderson and I am the Executive Director of the Washington Association of Landscape Professionals. This evening it's my pleasure to talk with you a bit about what low impact development is and what regulation changes are coming to Washington State. You are joining this webinar tonight as the result of WALP partnering with the Washington State Department of Ecology and WSNLA to provide professional education and training with regards to low impact development. In addition to this webinar, you can learn more about low impact development and how your business can benefit by visiting the WALP website at www.walp.org. For those of you not familiar with WALP and or WSNLA, they are not-for-profit organizations and Washington's largest landscaping membership organizations, providing a direct portal to the landscape professionals and nurseries. Members include landscape contractors focused on installation and maintenance, landscape designers, retail and wholesale nurseries, and other related firms and individuals, um, and other related firms and individuals. If you are not a current member of WALP or WSNLA, please visit our website. One of the key features of both organizations is the monthly magazines that uh, provide timely, practical, and thought-provoking information about the green industry. Currently running April through July are articles on the topic of low-impact development, so I encourage you to check out both of our, our magazines. Before introducing our keynote presenters for this evening's webinar, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about low impact development, how it helps to manage stormwater, and upcoming regulation changes that will affect the use of LID on development and redevelopment projects. For those of you who have attended other presentations, there will be a bit of repetition, so just bear with us uh, for a bit if you could, as there's a lot of new people in the audience tonight, so thank you. LID, or Low Impact Development, is an approach to managing stormwater runoff that helps to protect water quality and reduces or slows runoff amounts, restoring groundwater recharge and healthy habitats. Rain gardens are shallow depressions with amended soils and vegetation designed to mimic forest floors that absorb and filter stormwater. Bioretention facilities are engineered to store and treat stormwater by passing it through a designed soil mix and vegetation. They often include drains and control structures. LID also includes the use of permeable paving materials intended to allow passage of water through the pavement and into the ground. Also roofs or walls layered with waterproofing materials, growing medium and vegetation designed to help slow storm water. So uh, why all the talk about stormwater? Well, stormwater runoff results from rainfall or impervious surfaces such as roads and rooftops where it picks up pollutants and carries them to local waterways. Stormwater runoff is also one of the largest sources, sources of pollutants in urbanized areas of Washington State and is the largest contributor of pollutants entering Puget Sound. You can also see from our next slide that stormwater runoff causes erosion, sedimentation, sewage, overflows, and loss of wildlife habit, habitat, to name a few more impacts. Through the principles being shown on this slide, LID strives to manage stormwater where it falls, increasing the area in distribution of stormwater infiltration, thereby reducing its concentrated entry into water bodies. And in this side, slide, you can see some of the many benefits of LID. So how is stormwater regulated? It is regulated through the Clean Water Act, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, the Washington State Department of Ecology, and municipal permits. As it was mentioned at the beginning of this evening's webinar, regulatory changes are coming. The Department of Ecology is making regula regulatory changes to stormwater management and the use of LID to address the negative impacts of stormwater in our urban and natural landscape. Regulation changes will take place between 2015 and 2018. In Western Washington, regulations will require the use of LID on development of redevelopment projects to help manage stormwater. In Eastern Washington, the use of LID will also be allowed. Each jurisdiction will decide how to adopt these changes. 
the Department of Ecology stormwater regulations will be the minimum. Some jurisdictions may decide to expand upon these regulations. So you will want to check with your local planning departments to understand how exactly these regulations will be applied in your area. In addition, we'll be emailing a handout to you that details the timings of when these regulation changes will take effect. Because the local jurisdictions are currently determining how they will adopt these new regulations, now is a good time to get in touch with your local officials and provide input on how these regulations should take effect. The Municipal Research and Services Center of Washington is a great resource for finding the right officials to contact. You may also want to contact officials in the planning departments of your cities and counties to gain a greater understanding of how these changes will affect you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our presenters for the evening. Rick Crooks is the Director of Business Development at Mutual Materials Company, a Pacific Northwest producer of masonry and hardscape products. He provides masonry and hardscape system information to Puget Sound design professionals. Recently, Rick led the development, introduction, and marketing of new products, as well as managed the commercial hardscapes sales division for Mutual. Rick has been a nationally respected instructor of quality assurance and special masonry inspection using curriculum developed by the, the Masonry Society. Rick holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Utah. Our second presenter is Sophia Pastors. She is owner of Innovative Landscape Technologies and founder of Farmer Frog. She teaches horticulture at Edmonds Community College. She is an award-winning landscape designer, certified low-impact development designer, and construction consultant, wetline delineator, certified professional horticulturist, certified tree risk assessor, and a certified arborist. As a consultant, Sophia often works with bioretention solutions, vegetated roofs, living walls, edible gardens, and integrated design principles. So please join me in welcoming our first presenter, Rick Crooks. Thank you, Patty. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, we're going to cover a very broad topic in just a few short minutes, so uh, be ready. We're going to go fast, but uh, before I begin, um, I wanted to make just a brief introduction of Mutual Materials. We're a uh, local family-owned business that was started in 1900 right here in Puget, Puget Sound. Uh, consequently, we have a very long-term focus here in the Pacific Northwest with over uh, 300 employees and 13 facilities, <coughs> excuse me, and 13 manufacturing facilities <coughs> and 16 sales outlets from uh, British Columbia to Salem, Oregon on the south. We first started producing permeable interlocking concrete pavers in, in the year 2000 and we've seen a very strong interest and growth in that product line. The development of the knowledge and skill of those designing, specifying, and installing permeable pavements of all types has increased rapidly in the last decade. It's been a very dynamic evolution of uh, knowledge base. So with that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I've got to press the right key, and I'll find out here soon. Okay, here we go. Um, permeable pavements are an integral part of a low impact development. Of low impact development can be a very effective strategy to help manage storm stormwater. We're going to uh, talk and go through very quickly a, a basic overview of all permeable pavement options. We can't hope to cover all the specifications and materials and designs and construction information in this short time, but we'll uh, we'll get a good introduction to the topic provide reference resources so each of you can gather more complete and helpful information for your projects. Starting out, we will review the why behind using permeable pavements and evaluate the basic components of the three most popular permeable systems. Each industry has standardized their nomenclature. Sometimes the names can be a little confusing, but porous asphalt, pervious concrete, and permeable interlocking concrete pavers are the standardized names for the systems we'll discuss tonight. If we have time, we'll also uh, introduce uh, and talk about uh, grid pavements and uh, porous aggregate concrete and porous uh, units. 
We're also going to provide additional reference sources for you to get up-to-date design and proper construction information for each pavement system, as well as review the general construction procedures and sequencing for each. And last but not least, we will discuss their maintenance requirements. With permeable pavements, the pavement itself now becomes a stormwater management facility, so maintenance is required, and uh, just like it would be for any other facility. We'll provide some information to help you with assessing those demands for your individual projects. I think we have a poll question here. Here's the results. And the results are coming. So the poll question was to ask what types of permeable pavements have you used? Looks like a few have used uh, asphalt and concrete, a little more with pavers. A lot of you are new to permeable pavements, so that's uh, that's good to know. And and I'll try. Uh, we'll ask this question again later in the in the uh, session in a similar way to see if uh, if we get uh, a little bit more information uh, from everyone. So so thank you for that information on the polls. I'll try and introduce those a little earlier so we get better answering. So why permeable pavements? Permeable pavements are on the Environmental Protection Agency's menu of best management practices for helping to control stormwater runoff, and they're an integral part of a comprehensive low-impact development strategy. Permeable pavements are considered an infiltration and detention practice, much like a detention pond that holds water for a time, allows for infiltration into the native soil. Um, also, by conserving, we conserve space with permeable pavements by combining a functional pavement with a stormwater facility. We get the economic benefit of these multiple functions being performed by just one structure, and this reduces the amount of space required on a site. Permeable pavements can also can handle the typical high-frequency, low-intensity storms that a watershed receives, especially here in the Northwest. They can be designed to manage most, if not all, the rainfall that uh, will help to meet uh, ecology's uh, flow control requirements. It's these high-frequency, low-intensity storms that contribute most to our stormwater pollution problem. Permeable pavements help with this critical concern by being part of this effective low-impact development strategy. We help mim mimic a site's pre-developed pre forested condition, which in turn reduces the impact on our streams and other receiving waters. We can reduce uh, retention and detention and drainage fees. Retention ponds are permanent ponds that store runoff from surrounding areas. The ponds are expensive to maintain and consume valuable real estate. Uh, we've got a polling question here too. So, so take a look at that. We're gonna ask uh, those of you who have had experience with permeable pavements, why did you specify or build them and uh, maintain them? Or do you specify, build, or maintain them? Uh, required for permitting, help solve a drainage problem, was on the plan, or uh, uh, you think it's important to include low impact development when possible before you see it as a business opportunity. So respond to that and we'll uh, tell you the results here soon. An increasing number of municipalities in, storm in North America have stormwater utilities which charge fees, much like water and sanitary utility uh, or sewer fees. These fees are usually based on the amount of impervious cover on a site. So some municipalities will reduce fees when permeable pavements are used instead of other more impervious surfacing. Uh, and they will also filter and reduce nutrients. We can get some uh, together with the subgrade soil as an entire system, the permeable pavement will filter and reduce nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus. We can even filter out uh, metals uh, and, re and uh, reduce those, the impact uh, to the environment by uh, by filtering them through the subgrade soil. Some finer grain bioretention soils work best uh, to do this. Uh, the Department of Ecology does not allow, however, treatment credit for just the permeable pavement alone. Systems incorporating other bioretention facilities and suitable subgrade soils, though, with permeable pavements on the surface can be used to achieve specific project treatment goals. And finally, groundwater recharge. Because water is introduced back into the soil, there's a certainly potential for groundwater recharge. This is important in areas that rely on groundwater for their water supply and also in other areas where recharged groundwater systems mean that streams will maintain flows and support indigenous aquatic life. Our poll results, do we have those yet or are we still waiting for those? Here's our poll results. So um, 
it looked like we, we helped solve uh, some, some problems on the site with a few of you. It was important for low impact development, so our audience is very interested in that. And uh, we're still, a few of you still got to press that polling button. So let's, uh, let's uh, see if we can up the ante on our poll question. When we evaluate a site to consider using permeable pavements, one of the first steps is to measure the ability of the existing soil to infiltrate stormwater. The permeable system has to be engineered to accommodate hydrological demands. Part of that evaluation is to examine the soil under the system. We also need to evaluate the structural capacity of the subgrade to design our pavement for traffic. This is mostly a concern when we're looking at heavy loads from municipal, commercial, and industrial applications. Determining soil infiltration rates for a site is fairly involved. Initially, we'll need to classify the soil um, and understand the geology, a little bit of the geology of the site. The soil maps that are usually available from the county government and the uh, uh, U.S. Natural Resource Conservation Service, the NRCS, also the USCS, the Uniform Soil Classification System, provide broad guidance on the ability of a site to soil to infiltrate. The NRCS classification system provides a generalized range of infiltration rates. They're labeled A, B, C, and D, A having the highest permeability and B having the lowest. The USCS, or the Unified Soil Classification System, is widely used by engineers. This can provide bracketed uh, estimation of infiltration rates and can be used to estimate important structural information like California bearing ratio and R values. Standard engineering text can give you more information on on how those uh, classification systems are used. An important part of the design process is now determining the design or lifetime infiltration of the soil subgrade. An effective permeable pavement design balances the structural needs of the pavement with the hydrologic needs. Typically, pavement construction requires compacting the subgrade soil in a, in a traditional pavement. We don't want to see that in permeable pavements, however, because to meet hydrology requirements, permeable pavements function best when the subgrade has not been compacted. Soil subgrades may not meet, need compaction for structure, especially on pedestrian or residential driveways, but for larger projects, laboratory tests on soil samples correlating structural capacity of the existing soil and the infiltration capacity should be done. Most effective approach for substantially sized project is to conduct an infiltration test right on the site using multiple test holes, as you see here. The holes are strategically located and dug to a depth that corresponds to the bottom of the permeable base. After obtaining the data, we make estimates to arrive at the subgrade design infiltration rate. And there's other tests, ASTM tests and others, that uh, you'll need to really uh, uh, check with a qualified geotechnical engineer familiar with site evaluation methods that are uh, suitable and approved by the Department of Ecology is acceptable for evaluating the infiltration on the site. I also wanted to talk briefly about handling slope sites. Slope slight sites, say that fast ten times, slope sites require special attention to make sure that the subsurface flow of the stormwater has time to actually infiltrate. The common practice is to add a series, a series of impervious check dams in the base, which will allow stormwater to pond in the base aggregate and then infiltrate into the native soil. Remember, the, the infiltration rate of the native soil is often a lot lower than the permeable pavement, so you're going to get a little bit of uh, delay or detention in the, in the base while that uh, stormwater begins to infiltrate. The spacing and size and frequency of these dams will depend on the slope of the site and the permeability of the native soil. So that's a quick overview of the basics of the design for all the permeable systems. Let's now look at, uh, start to look at the individual specific permeable pavement systems. First one is porous asphalt. A porous asphalt section contains full depth porous material which allows for free flow of water through the wearing course to the subgrade for infiltration or routing to treatment. Porous asphalt has, uh, has been used for years as a um, porous friction course, or PFC, to reduce highway spray and to lower wa uh, road noise. But for a permeable pavement system, it's not used as just an overlay. It's used completely through the depth of the pavement, a porous section. 
Porous asphalt hasn't been promoted much here locally. We kind of saw that in our poll uh, for on smaller residential projects, but it has been used on streets and roads successfully. Uh, approximate minimum batches for asphalt is about 40 tons from an asphalt uh, hot mix asphalt plant. So, so that may limit its use on some smaller applications, uh, some smaller residential applications, but, uh, but it is effective material to use. Here's an application uh, on a porous pavement project uh, adjacent to a standard pavement that was used in Arizona on State Route 87. Uh, it's still in use after about 20 years, functioning well, um, and, uh, and uh, it's good comparison. What uh, uh, I understand from the reports that the, uh, the, it functions very well. The, there is no sheet flow or surface water on the porous side where, where there is on the uh, opposite side of the, the street. So, so we can see uh, uh, some benefit uh, from a safety standpoint in using, uh, using permeable pavements as well. Okay, here's a cross section of a typical porous asphalt uh, uh, design. There's show, this shows three inches of porous asphalt. A lot of times the asphalt section will need to be a little thicker than standard asphalt as a traffic wearing course. There's then a choker course, and I'll explain what that is in a few minutes here. And then 18 inches in this particular design of a storage reservoir layer or sub-base. Uh, the project requires compaction of the soil subgrade. If you notice in that note right here, uh, subgrade compacted to 92%. That, that uh, contradicts what I said earlier about we often don't want to. This particular soil subject, uh, this particular design may have required it for structure. But in any event, if, if uh, it is required, it's good to uh, uh, scarify the face of, or the surface of that subgrade soil before we, uh, before we put a permeable pavement so on top so that we can uh, uh, get a little more infiltration through that subgrade. Okay, the components of porous asphalt pavement are the hot mix asphalt wearing course. The uh, National Asphalt Pavement Association, that's NAPA, has specifications for porous asphalt that are listed in the first bullet here. Typically, a higher content of asphalt binder is required compared to a standard asphalt, the amount of binder in a standard asphalt uh, wearing course. Also, there's additives added, polymers and other things to help keep the binder coating on the aggregate and not drain down through the pavement. Um, the use of a choker course is really dependent on the gradation of the reservoir aggregate. Choker courses bridge the smaller uh, asphalt course aggregates and help keep the pavement surface stable over the larger aggregates in the, in the reservoir course. Typically in choker course material we're using about a three-quarter inch rock clean crushed with no fines. That's important. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, remember that on all of our pavements. All of the aggregates are typically clean, crushed and uh, with no fines in them, so we can get the infiltration through the system. Some uh, projects have been successful in porous asphalt without a choker course, but it really, uh, but most industry specifications still, still call for that course, and it's uh, often recommended. For the storage reservoir aggregate, use uh, the uh, specification noted here in, in, in the fourth bullet, uh, Washington DOT section 903.9, and two for permeable ballast. Uh, that's out of the uh, uh, 2012 uh, specification, standard specifications for road and bridge construction uh, manual. It's important, again, I don't want to overemphasize, but I really can overemphasize how important it is to use clean, crushed aggregates that are, that are durable. Crushed aggregates compact better without a lot of force. So rounded rock won't compact well. It'll typically roll with the traffic. So we want to make sure that we have a large uh, 90 to 100 percent of possible fractured face material in our, in our aggregates. Okay, base and sub-base aggregates. Here's a slide showing uh, in relative terms the, the larger reservoir course base aggregate on the bottom uh, and the smaller choker course material on the top. So it gives you a good idea of the scale of what uh, types of aggregates you'll see here. There is industry uh, publication helps for you, the National Asphalt Pavement Association. 
has uh, this document. You can uh, see that on the website, www.asphaltpaving.org. And in their uh, online store, the document IS-131, it's a 24-page document. It's for designers, contractors, and uh, owners. So I'd, uh, all, anybody that's interested can go and get a lot more information and detail on as per porous asphalt systems in that document. Here's the uh, construction sequencing. It starts with site preparation. Uh, all of the permeable pavement systems, it's very important to keep heavy equipment off the excavated subgrade to avoid unnecessary compaction or overcompaction of that material. We, we use a process called back dumping. It's typically opposite of what we normally use in, in pavement construction. We don't, uh, we don't uh, put our construction equipment on the, on the uncompacted subgrade or on the subgrade soil. We, we push the aggregate from our trucks and in front of our uh, uh, working equipment, our heavy equipment, and push the aggregate over the uh, subgrade. And you see that's happening here in these slides. Uh, back, back dumping is, is the term that a lot of the construction industry professionals will use, and it's very important to help keep, keep the uh, tires of the equipment clean so you can back dump over that uh, porous asphalt or porous uh, aggregate and not contaminate it with fines or sediment. And then after the reservoir course is placed and compacted, you'll place and roll the choker course and then place the porous asphalt on top of that using a standard asphalt uh, paver, uh, paver uh, equipment. Some examples, I've got a couple of slides here uh, of a project on the upper left is a slide of a, of a street in Tumwater. Lower right is a paved trail in South Prairie. And the city of Puyallup has also used porous asphalt in a number of their applications, as well as the other uh, permeable systems. There's also a large parking lot in Marysville that uh, successfully used porous asphalt to uh, help meet some of their flow control uh, guidelines. So now let's go to pervious concrete. Looking uh, at, uh, at this system, it's basically the same as regular concrete. The components are the same, except we do not use sand or fines in the mix. Uh, this, this creates voids in the mix, as you would expect, from just the aggregate and cement coating the, ag the larger aggregate. This open structure allows for quick drainage of, of surface water when we use it as a pervious uh, pavement system. It functions differently than asphalt and pavers, which we have yet to describe, uh, in, in that it's a rigid a structural system. That means the thickness of the concrete wearing course carries the structural load of the system as opposed to a flexible system like asphalt or pavers, which requires increasing the thickness of the base to carry the uh, heavy structural loads. Here's a typical pervious concrete cross section with the wearing course on the top right here and the, and the uh, uh, reservoir course below that. Note this same node again here to compact typically don't like to see those in, in drawings if it can be avoided, but it may, this was from the University of Central Florida, and it may have uh, been required to, to uh, meet their subgrade requirements. So, uh, but uh, very simple, very easy. Uh, uh, no choker course is needed with pervious concrete. Uh, you'll just uh, increase the section to get to higher load carrying capacities. There's a few differences and a few uh, things we'll discuss about uh, materials and specifications for rigid or for uh, pervious concrete. It, as I mentioned, it is a rigid structure, so we, we increase the thickness of the concrete to get more load carrying capacity. Um, the the uh, structure, you know, this this will help us in structural uh, concerns, but uh, hydraulic design may govern, and so we may still have to have a significant amount of base beneath the. Uh, pervious concrete. In fact, we often do here in our area to, to handle the hydrologic design. So, so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a, good, a good system to use uh, when you have uh, large structural concerns and, uh, and heavy, heavy loads uh, because you can take a lot of that in the, in the wearing course itself, the concrete. Um, it, an important po component to know is that the, uh, there is contractor certification available here locally in, in uh, in the concrete industry. They have an excellent uh, program for certifying contractors, as we'll see in the upcoming slides. While the pervious concrete material is similar to standard concrete, there are substantial differences. And, and I've started to outline those here. There, it's a very stiff mix. Because of the lack of fines, we don't take a lot of water, and, uh, and that uh, we, 
uh, consequently, we don't test for slump or test for compressive strength in a cylinder. Uh, the mix is, is stiff enough that it can't be pumped. It has to be uh, delivered to the site manually and then compacted in place with a roller and covered uh, with plastic while curing. So these are things that are not necessarily uh, uh, standard concrete placement practice. They need to be uh, understood with pervious concrete to get successful performance. There is also industry um, resources for pervious concrete. Those are uh, provided by the National Ready Mix, Asso Ready Mix Concrete Association. Locally, there is a uh, Puget Sound Concrete Specification Council. Andy Marks is, uh, leads that, and you can, uh, I'd suggest you go online to his website, theconcretecouncil.org. There's a lot of good information there, uh, examples of, uh, of projects. And you can also go to the Portland Cement Association. Uh, their website is cement.org and download this or uh, order this document, uh, Pervious Concrete Pavements, which is a good introduction to, to uh, uh, Pervious Concrete. We'll talk uh, a little bit about the uh, construction sequencing here. You'll see in the upper left hand slide, this is the screed that's used to level and screed off the concrete. You can't see a lot how stiff that mix is. But even in uh, slides from the industry, you'll see some no-nos here. Notice the concrete truck is backing in across the, the uh, uh, subgrade. We don't like to see that. So if at all possible, and there may not have been another option here, but we want to see that truck uh, not uh, compacting the subgrade that we're laying the previous pavement on. Next is uh, in the upper right-hand corner, it's uh, rolled. This compacts and densifies the surface uh, enough to, uh, to still allow water through, but give uh, it compacts it uh, a little bit till we get to get a proper structural uh, uh, structural uh, co uh, capacity, carrying capacity for that stiff mix. We still put control joints and crack control joints uh, using uh, this big, uh, looks like a pizza cutter uh, that scores those joints in the lower right hand, very important. Since we have no fines, we don't have a lot of water held in the mix and, uh, and we need to cover it to, to get proper curing. That, so those, uh, those uh, plastic covers need to stay in place a lot of times they blow away, so effective uh, use of the, of the uh, quality control of uh, concrete, pervious concrete, is to make sure those stay in place for at least seven days, and then the pavement can be, uh, can be used after that. You'll see some examples here in a couple of slides. This is a pervious concrete project. Notice the colors of the concrete. Concrete can be, uh, pervious concrete, just like regular concrete, can be colored to uh, accentuate uh, the aesthetic of the material. And here's a, a large parking lot in Fredrickson um, that used a substantial amount of pervious concrete, an excellent application in this uh, retail parking lot. And here's a, a residential parking or a residential application in Sultan, Washington that used uh, pervious concrete and drives and walks and the street. Okay, the last system we'll examine in some detail here is permeable interlocking concrete pavers. Unlike the other systems, uh, these paving stones are solid. They're not porous. Uh, the, uh, the paver itself is not permeable. It's a standard dense concrete paving stone. The permeability is achieved through openings in the stones or joints between the, the pavers. Structurally, though, this behaves as a flexible pavement. Here's a cross-section of uh, permeable interlocking concrete pavements. We have the, the wearing course on the top here. The next course down is, a, is a, fine, a smaller aggregate, not a fine aggregate, but a smaller crushed rock, about a quarter inch crushed. We sometimes in the industry call it a number eight. That stands for an ASTM specification that uh, D448, uh, maybe a little more numbers you need here. Basically what you're gonna ask for at the, uh, at the gravel pit is a quarter inch chipped or a three eighths chipped rock. Again, all crushed, no rounded rock, no fines in the mix. The choke course, is a four inch layer of uh, number 57 or a three quarter to one inch uh, aggregate that basically bridges uh, the, the bedding course to the larger number two aggregate, which is really a two to three inch stone. Now these, the reservoir course is the same that's used in the other, the permeable ballast that's referenced in the other materials. Uh, and, the, and the choker course is the same as what would be used in an in a asphalt course, asphalt application. The only difference with pavers is we have this bedding layer that helps seat the paver and, uh, and is also used in the joints between the pavers or the, or the voids there. And sometimes, depending on the native soil, we'll see a geotextile used if we've got a real fine-grained soil, and that's the same in any, 
any of the systems as well. Types of permeable pavers, there's a lot of, there's a wide variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. Some of them are patented, some of them are available in only certain areas, but uh, uh, locally uh, we've got a number of permeable pavements uh, that our company makes as well as other companies make, and, and we'll provide you with a, a wide palette to choose as far as shapes and colors and sizes. I want to talk a little bit about surface infiltration of, of uh, permeable pavers. The uh, infiltration rate of the stone that's used in the joints typically ranges in an area of three to 1,200 uh, inches per hour. The stone that we see here, the quarter inch chip or the number eight stone, we see roughly around 12, about 1,000 to 1,200 inches per hour. The pavers themselves vary about uh, between eight and 18 percent void area. So let's take an example of, say, we have a stone that has 1,000 inches per hour, 12% avoid area, open area in the paver. You're going to see a, 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 an available or estimated calculated surface infiltration rate of 120 inches per hour. So, so this is uh, the initial surface rate. Now, it's not to be confused with the subgrade soil um, infiltration rate. That's typically in the range of, of less than an inch per hour and sometimes in fractions of inches per hour. But this, uh, this is what will drain through the surface of the paver. Sometimes we, we get uh, confused that because pavers are, vo are hard and, and solid that we won't get the same infiltration. We can capture storms up to 120 inches an hour initially here on, on permeable pavements. So uh, Hurricane Katrina, as I remember, was about an inch and a half per hour. So, so we can handle uh, a, lot of, a lot of storm in a permeable pavement. The industry publication is the interlocking uh, of the industry as represented by the Interlocking Concrete Pavement Institute and, uh, and they have a, an excellent design manual that uh, can be uh, available at their website for purchase or uh, I'll have my slide contact information up on the last slide here and you can feel free to get a hold of me and we'd be happy to get, uh, get you uh, availability to that publication. It's an excellent publication, over 90 pages and uh, it's been revised in its fourth edition. Uh, a lot of, lot of work in the industry has gone into this the document, a lot of good overall design information here for you as well. Construction sequencing in the, in the base is just like the other two pavements. We, we back dump the uh, large reservoir aggregate as in with the asphalt. We, we uh, have the number 57 choker course. Those are static rolled and compacted in place. Again, a, a, a note here to make sure we don't over compact the subgrade soil during uh, construction. That'll, that'll defeat our purpose of trying to get infiltration. Uh, typical uh, compaction or construction equipment will compact the soil and reduce the, uh, the permeability of that uh, subgrade. So back dumping, here's another. Here's a truck coming in from the side of the pavement to get the aggregate there, not uh, going along the, uh, the uh, uh, subgrade to uh, dump the material. Spreading the base material again is, is pushing that material, keeping a clean wheeled vehicles on the on the uh, open graded aggregate and pushing that over to the uh, uncompacted subgrade. Spreading the base, that is spreading the uh, choker course or the final grading of the base, done the same way. And what do we do here? Okay. And then compacting the base material. Sorry, it looks like we got a little, little uh, 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 blurb in our uh, in our in our video that was supposed to play here, but we're not going to play that. The uh, notice here are the lines in this in this compact area. This is showing the area of compacting. We keep compacting these open graded aggregates until we don't get lines or movement in the base. It's a prescriptive uh, uh, way. It's not. We don't. We can't uh, test for compaction in an open graded. Uh, aggregate, we just have to do it prescriptively, so we compact till we don't get movement. Here we're then screening the uh, number eight uh, stone over the bay, over the choke course. Uh, a lot of uh, the larger contractors are using laser guided equipment, which really uh, speeds up that process. Another uh, another uh, labor saving device, and when appropriate on larger projects, is to use mechanical installation equipment. It roughly it takes a uh, uh, a layer of pavers and and, uh, and installs them about 10 square feet at a time. So a very uh, results in about a 50 percent uh, uh, increase in, in labor productivity and reduction in 
in uh, cost of the pavement. You can see here in this slide, we estimate uh, manually you can lay uh, 1,000 to 2,000 square feet per man per day. I can lay about 10, uh, but <laughs> some some guys will lay 2,000 square feet. So. So, uh, but not me. Most most machine operators can do up to 10,000 or even more square foot per day. So, a substantial uh, benefit to, to costs and, and labor savings and savings uh, ergonomically too uh, for using mechanical installation. After the pavers are set, then they're then they're uh, cut in place and uh, cut up against the edge restraint. In this case, it's a concrete curb and. Uh, then the pavers themselves are compacted, and that, that seats them. We set the pavers about three eighths of an inch to a half inch high, uh, be, because in this compaction process, they'll settle into that number eight layer. And then, uh, apologize for those media files here too, but then we uh, fill the openings with the, after that initial compaction, fill the openings with the number eight stone, and then go back and do one final compaction, and, uh, and there won't be any waiting for uh, for curing because pavers are cured in the factory and uh, we can use the pavement immediately after this final compaction. Uh, it's, a, it's a great structural system to use in cases where we need to get on and off uh, uh, the pavement quickly. So, or get on the pavement quickly. I want to point out, we sh you know, I like this slide because it shows uh, during the construction process keeping that fine grain sediment away from the pavers or away from the permeable pavement, any system really would, would require that. I'm going to show you a couple of slides here of, of uh, some, some nice paver projects. It's a residential uh, walkway and, and patio, uh, very nicely done, multiple colors, uh, great layout and, and bonding here. One In parking structures, um, uh, one of the things that can be done instead, you can see here you can, you can paint uh, uh, lines just like you would in a standard uh, parking lot area or do uh, the handicapped uh, uh, labeling and paint lines here, but also by using alternate colors of pavers, you can delineate parking lines and, and that uh, permanently with with uh, with just uh, with just the uh, uh, use of different colors of pavers. And okay, if you were to use permeable pavement on your next project, what pavement system would you prefer to use? And the ones we've discussed: porous asphalt, pervious concrete, permeable pavers or other systems that you may be aware of, or E, none so far. So uh, give us a good indication of, uh, of uh, if, you're, if you're here and with us, and then we'll, uh, we'll be able to take a look at that poll and, and see if we've captured everybody back on, on, the, on the webinar. Again, apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to go through this particular slide to keep us on, on target uh, schedule-wise. So another option that we can consider when the uh, uh, is, is that of partial exfiltration or infiltration into the subgrade. Many uh, dense soils that uh, we have in our area are less than a, a quarter of an inch per hour uh, infiltration rate in the, in the soil, and they can't fully infiltrate. So we, we, we have too much water, storm water, to be able to, to get into the soil in, uh, with that low of an uh, infiltration rate. Uh, or, or the base would have to be too thick for uh, economy. So, so uh, uh, permeable pit si pavement systems, though, can still be used in this, uh, with this option. We put uh, perforated drain pipes as under drains to route the water uh, to outfall for additional flow control and treatment. We still get the benefit of, uh, of using this pervious pavement system as a detention basin, but, uh, but we don't get credit for uh, flow control or treatment uh, by our Department of Ecology when we, when we go to the under drain method, so keep that in mind. But it may, it may help. Uh, you're able to take the surface water off. Here's the answer for a poll. So it looks like uh, we have had a lot of uh, a lot of you uh, uh, used have used the uh, pervious pavers, which makes sense if we've got a uh, a residential based audience. Uh, uh, so we've got a good experience base there, and and looks like we didn't lose uh, too many. So appreciate appreciate your uh, answering that poll, and we'll keep uh, keep going now. Here to we're just about through with the per, with the uh, permeable pavement. I did want to cover a couple of additional design details, uh, overflow drains and drainings to drain, draining uh, through to a grass uh, swale. All systems, asphalt, concrete, or pavers, then uh, must handle the overflow from large storm events or oversaturated conditions. And this can be handled with uh, traditional uh, storm drains uh, or openings in the curb that allow the excess water to surface flow off into a swale. 
Let's talk quickly about maintenance. Um, basic maintenance is important. I, I tell everybody that basically our pavement now with pervious pavements and permeable pavements becomes a, a large catch basin, the whole pavement does. So depending on your site conditions, whether you've got a tree-lined street or or, uh, or an open parking lot, you can uh, at least you should at least annually perform a checks, uh, basic checks and minimum maintenance to keep the pavement functioning as a stormwater maintenance facility or stormwater management facility, and, and avoid the situation you see here in this photo with the uh, uh, aggregate, uh, obviously during construction, spilling over into the pavement and uh, potentially damaging that. So. Uh, a simple checklist can be developed for a site, even a, a residential uh, site can have a simple checklist like this where we tell the uh, owners or those responsible for maintenance to vacuum the surface and the frequency to do that more often again on a, uh, with a lot of uh, heavy uh, organic material uh, either sloping into the site or from trees or other, uh, other uh, 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 features of the site. Replenish the aggregates if it's a permeable paver. Uh, put it, put aggregate back in the joints if that becomes washed out. And inspect the vegetation and surrounding uh, conditions to make sure uh, there's a proper cover and stability of those and to check the drain outfalls to make sure we're not clogging or preventing uh, uh, the outfall from, uh, from occurring in case we have a large, a large uh, event. And to help with that, the uh, Department of Ecology has uh, uh, started, a, has a new, uh, uh, O&M, an, uh, an operation and, and maintenance document that uh, was developed in, in conjunction with Herrera uh, Environmental Consultants and the Washington Stormwater Center. You can get this online. I'm pausing here as long as I can to let you jot that down. You'll get copies of this slide later. So uh, it was in an email from uh, from Catherine. So so uh, look for that, and you'll be able to uh, download this document for free off the. Uh, uh, Department of Ecology website. If you go into uh, the DO, uh, DOE website uh, and, and surf around a little bit, just, just enter in their search engine on their site, uh, uh, LID O&M, and you'll get this uh, document. Will, uh, uh, page for this document will come up. It's 194 pages. It's very comprehensive. covers all the bioretention and, and different systems, and an excellent looks to be an excellent document. Maintenance. So with pavers or other things where you have weeds growing up or even at the uh, edges of uh, concrete systems and, and asphalt systems or in the pores of those open graded systems, you can get uh, growth. And, and we typically don't want to use a, a pesticide. We'll use a weed burner. So as you see in the upper left-hand slide here, we can also use uh, portable vacuum equipment. It will help uh, suck out any sediment and keep the uh, pavement clean. And then for larger expanses, we use uh, larger uh, sweeper trucks. And, and a traditional broom sweeper is not as effective as a regenerator there and less effective than the, uh, than the pure vacuum trucks that are, that are, uh, are becoming uh, available now. And I think on this uh, slide here, uh, how do I get this to be, play? It looks like it's, we might have to take control back. Oh, so. Yep. So uh, Greta will take control. All right, we're going to play a short two-minute video here from uh, Elgin Sweeper Company that uh, that shows uh, it's very musical and it shows a uh, good uh, good uh, maintenance application of how main, uh, how a pavement can be restored uh, using uh, using uh, these va this uh, heavy-duty vacuum equipment. We've got a little bit of buffering problem here, but you'll you'll see uh, this is a, a, a pure vacuum sweeper truck uh, going over a, a, a permeable pavement installation, and it is uh, it is cleaning out the, uh, the the debris that's in the in the uh, lodged into the uh, hole in the in the void area in that permeable pavement. You know what? Since this is going so slow, let's let's bypass it, and we won't keep everybody. Uh, uh, I hate it when that happens, but yeah, uh, <laughs> so we're gonna pause that. But but uh, rest your we. It's a very effective video, and and I can put it on a on a uh, disc and get anybody that's interested in seeing that, especially you you that are here from a municipality. It's a very effective way to to help. Uh, um, 
help help clear or clean clog systems and on all the systems. It's surprising what the vacuum will be able to take out. And permeable pavements it can take out to an inch of aggregate, which is where most of the uh, clogging would occur. So, so uh, very effective in maintenance. I'm going to touch briefly on on grid pavements. You'll see here uh, a, a concrete grid pavement. Uh, they can also be used um, in uh, in uh, as, as permeable pavements, but uh, consider that with turf and, and, the, mater and the soil to uh, keep turf um, uh, green and, and, uh, and that here in our area, we'll, you'll typically uh, not get the level of permeability that you will in, in the other systems that we've talked about, so just keep that in mind. And uh, over time, the concrete basically becomes uh, uh, invisible, so or the plastic grids as well too. There's plastic grid systems here as well. So uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the chance to to go. I know we went fast on a lot of things, and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. So we'll pass it over to Zofia now. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, we will have questions at the end because of our few difficulties. We're running a little bit over time, but um, I, hopefully you guys can stick around and, and stay for a few questions at the end. We're getting, we're getting questions coming in. Hello, everybody. I'm um, Zofia Pastor, and um, I am the owner of Innovative Landscape Technologies. We um, do specialize in low-impact development uh, solutions in landscape. It doesn't mean that we only um, build green roofs, rain gardens, and permeable surface surfaces, and it doesn't mean that our sites are um, no longer artistic. So I want to talk about that, what it means if you choose to go in, down that path and um, pick low impact development as your uh, specialty. Oh, no. Okay, so. okay. all right, okay. Miles is travel. here we go. So we're going to have actually a poll here while I'm talking about why soils, uh, soils can make such a difference. Uh, Rick had mentioned that testing is really important. He talked about a lot of the large commercial and uh, industrial scale uh, projects with engineered technologies. But in smaller um, landscapes, often you will find that you will be wanting to install and be able to install patios and small walkways that don't necessarily require an engineer to design the subsurface. It's very important that you are familiar with what material you're using and you understand what uh, testing you have to do in order to um, get maximum results, you're still going to have to do soil testing. And um, one good example on how to test soils is um, for smaller scale. It's actually in the Rain Garden Handbook that is published by WSU, and uh, the new version is coming out pretty soon this month. You would need to do the same infiltration rate check for the permeable paper system than you would have to do for a rain garden because you will be relying on the soil underneath that system and you want to know what the drainage rate is. Um, you are going to have to dig a hole and test it and um, also test the soil to know if it's mostly clay or sand or what you're dealing with because that's going to drive the need for geotextile and a lot of other things in the specs. So you've got to be able to put those together. And uh, small projects, um, sometimes it's hard to find an engineer for who will be willing to work with very small projects, and it can also drive the price up. So as a designer, you have to be very familiar on how to do these tests right. And also what the timing is. If you can afford to actually time yourself on that in the winter rather than in the summer, you will get better results for infiltration rates for your system. Uh, we do um, prescribe pervious concrete sometimes in our projects. Our company does not uh, install pervious concrete. But as a designer, I have to be very familiar with what the requirements are for that. And uh, over the course of the years, price actually came down quite a bit. And I really find that if you're interested in concrete installations, it's a great niche. And I really encourage you to uh, take the certification course and get into that business you can see that you can actually have quite an artistic uh, expression with pervious concrete as well. 
So you can color it, you can uh, put some um, three-dimensional rocks and uh, metal and other art in it. It's a little bit different how you include that in there. You have to be uh, putting it in as you are uh, finishing the rolling and just before you cover the system with plastic. And um, it works. I will talk about uh, what it looks like over the course of the years. So this is actually a brand new installation. It's a few weeks old in 2007. Also purview pavement on that same side. Um, these were one of the first pavers that Mutual Materials made. Since then, they have a lot more variety. And uh, I actually uh, now prefer pavers with um, more tight uh, gaps, not these, big, not these big ones, and I will explain in a minute why. Although um, when it comes to maintenance, you couldn't see the video, but I have to tell you that if all uh, municipalities switched to the sweeper vacuum truck, we would have cleaner cities because I think that when you have those uh, street sweepers blowing the mess right into the front yard of people, it's not really pleasant. It's not good for people with asthma and other illnesses, and it's just uh, it's it's not cleaning. It's just moving the mess from one place to another. So um, I think that having pervious uh, surfaces actually generate a lot cleaner areas. So. Um, what does it look like five years later? This picture was taken actually four years later. This picture was taken four years ago. You see that the color had worn off from the blue color. You can re-stain it if you are uh, into that intense color. I prefer the look and the homeowner prefers the look of the more washed out blue. It's more of a natural color, so we'll see how it wears again in another four years. You have to realize that a lot of these materials are new on the, on the market and techniques. How to use them will be also new. So over time, um, you will see results that nobody else had before, and the more you share that, the more experience we will have together as a community. Um, you can see on the pavers that we have um, weed issues. And with these big gapped um, pavers, that is a challenge. And in small spaces, you cannot bring in a vacuum truck. So this becomes something that if this was solid pavers, you wouldn't have to do, meaning that you have to really get man on your hands and knees and dig stuff out and replace that um, aggregate. Not everybody is interested in doing so. Uh, if you are a maintenance company, this could become a niche. And you could actually uh, specialize in upkeep of permeable surfaces. So um, I think that there is a business opportunity here. Um, also important to note that when you're using purview pavement, yes, trees nearby, if planted at the time of the installation or after, will have access to water and oxygen and will not be pushing up that surface so readily as they do with the impervious surfaces. However, if the tree was installed there and it's grown into that space, I strongly encourage you to check where those roots are because installing purview pavement requires deeper excavation than your typical non-purview pavement, and that means that you could be cutting through important roots and creating a hazard instead of helping that tree. Um, you can see zero pave um, block um, pavers here. This is a material that's actually um, created out of aggregate in Vancouver, Washington with a two-part um, glue. It's an adhesive that holds it together. I recommend from the experience that I had with this material that you use it where you don't have to cut it much because as you cut it, aggregates will be popping out from the material and you can end up with some very funky uh, edges. It's um, a two, little shy of two inches uh, thick, comes in 12 by 12 or 16 by 16 and many different colors, very beautiful material, actually, really artistic. But um, the weight-bearing um, structural um, capacity of that stone is not the same as um, concrete pavers. So it can handle a lightweight, small um, vehicle, personal vehicle, but not anything bigger. Um, most of our landscaper trucks will not be um, OK on it. You can use it in driveways as um, inlay or stripes or some uh, decorative surface, but not as the main area. It's okay for walkways and patios. So when I'm looking at concrete versus asphalt or any other material, in fact, this um, 
um, comparison charts we developed with the Sustainable Development Task Force of Snohomish County many, many years ago. And we use these um, bullet points to evaluate the material and make decisions on what we want to use. What are the installation issues? Meaning, um, what soil conditions you need, what um, weather conditions you need for installation, what specific uh, licensing and certification you need to be able to use those materials. This is all installation issues. Cost per area, durability, and how long will that material be around without problems. Uh, the lifetime performance, and that includes the maintenance cost of things. Um, look and feel. It's very important. In the beginning, when we started with pervious concrete, we had really large gaps with the aggregate um, voids. And so women in high heel couldn't really use it in the parking lot. They arrived at the place and they couldn't get out of their cars. So that means a, a big, it's a big important piece. Also, the look of it. You know, not everybody's um, going crazy about Rice Krispie in their driveway because that's what actually most of the previous concrete looks like. Um, I love it, but it's, you know, personal preference. Short-term and long-term effects. Uh, concrete will leach um, uh, a little bit, and so it will increase your pH around, uh, but it will go away. Asphalt, on the other hand, actually has a lot of things that are carcinogens. So um, that's something to think about, and that's a long-term effect. Benefits, you know, how, how is it going to be impacting uh, in a good way your site now and later? What are, for example, the heat island effects or uh, how does it um, work with uh, filtration of the water, not just allowing it to get into the soil, but does it do anything else? Maintenance and end of life solutions. In the end, when you no longer want that material, you have to do something with it. And what will that require? Do you add to the landfill or you actually can recycle it and reuse it? What's going on with that? To me, it's a very important element. I usually prefer things I can reuse and recycle. So uh, this image here shows uh, turf block. Something that we're learning in the Northwest to think about is it's really troublesome to grow turf, period, even with that concrete in it. So then you try to grow grass, turf, with concrete, and usually you're not going to succeed. So uh, using other grant covers in the Northwest rather than turf may be um, a better way to go. Another thing is that if it's a heavily used parking lot, I guarantee it won't look nice for long because in the winter the grass will be uh, compacted out and with the wet conditions be killed off. And in the summer, if you don't water it around here, it will look really bad. So that's something to think about. I actually prefer clover seeds, believe it or not. It's good for pollinators. You don't have to mow it, but you can, and try to kill clover. So um, that's going to be a uh, self-fertilizing plant. It's high in nitrogen, so it's a good use for this particular um, zone. Uh, really quick, quick back to it, one more thing. In Seattle, uh, they found that on slopes, turf uh, block can become very slippery in the winter, so be careful using it on anything that's steeper than 4 or 5%. Natural stones, if you actually put these on the same base that you do use um, the concrete papers, they can work just as pervious, and they will look more natural. You can put some plants in between, too, on purpose. So instead of having to deal with dandelions that grow up, by the way, good salad material, but having to deal with that, now you have uh, ground covers that you want in between these stones. And I had done this with great success on many, many projects, uh, sometimes even using uh, concrete, broken concrete, and it will work well. It's not an engineered system, so you can't use it on large scale, but in small patio settings, it will do just as good of a job. So specs are not created equal, and that's uh, very important to know. Also, when Rick was talking about the washed aggregate, Make sure that your supplier follows through on those specs. Don't just trust and don't, be, don't make the mistake of not being there on the delivery day. You want to see everything that comes to your site. Once it's dumped, it's your job to take it out of there, and you have to make sure what you expect is what you ordered. So um, you also have to check with your jurisdictions. Some cities and counties will have a little bit different spec requirements than others. And if they vary greatly from what the engineer uh, documentation for that particular material prescribes, ask why and, and investigate. Make sure that the city and the jurisdiction actually is familiar with that material and there is good reason behind their differences. Um, 
things also change. So if you look up something online that's two or three or five years old, it may not be true anymore because down the line we found that something else works better. Always uh, check into the newest things. Uh, meaning that like right now we have our um, stormwater manual ad from last year. Don't use the 2005. Get the 2012 and look stuff up in that. Um, old reference material is just a sure way to get into trouble. And then you have to do major repairs. So here is, for example, analyze the spec. It's um, showing, for example, filter fabric lines uh, subsurface bed. Not always. And it's not always going up on the sides. And sometimes, actually, we don't want sloped excavation, but we want straight lines going down, depending on what soil you're dealing with. Make sure that you are using the right um, subgrade in the right way. And uh, if you have to substitute anything, then it is actually approved for that substitution. Uh, we cannot be, when we say creativity, we don't mean creativity with the specs. We mean creativity with design, with outline, with look of things, but actually the structural setup is very important to remain the same. We are building stormwater facilities that are doubling as driveways, patios, and walkways. So um, it's not just uh, a one function, but it's um, an integrated system. So here we go with creativity. Non-engineered projects are very fun. I've worked with engineers a lot, and um, I actually enjoy that. Uh, growing up with engineers, I think that it's bringing family home. But um, I also love the sites when it's non-engineered, and I love working with people who can think outside the box or outside the paper um, and uh, concrete using that material in different ways. So you can use recycled concrete, flex stones, you can also create patterns. Don't, don't be afraid um, using um, ideas and just experimenting. And you know what I find also as a business um, owner running in low impact development, when I talk to clients, many of them are willing to actually experiment and see what happens because they understand the need for um, new ideas emerging and, and um, Ex uh, examine. So you have to use deep layer of key gravel sometimes. Uh, rounded gravel actually can be also used, but then you don't put any paper on top. So that's another thing you can use, and I will have some images showing that. Know that if you use that as a walkway, it's a very slow walkway. It's a meditation walk. You cannot run through deep layer of pea gravel. But it will hold a lot of water, and it will reduce runoff. Um, so not a main walking area. Near steep areas, heavy clay, uh, lots, uh, lots of organic material around. You have to check if you, it's okay to use infiltration systems, which are permeable papers. Maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe you, you are in an area that's uh, sensitive and can have a landslide uh, happen. and um, Nothing can be infiltrated. In those cases, even on small projects, you do want to work with an engineer. Absolutely. So that's that's very very important. Then, um, and size and shape, uh, anything can be utilized to a degree. Rick was mentioning that on uh, pervious asphalt, there is the 40 ton minimum. So you're definitely not going to be doing it on small scale. Even with the concrete, um, the concrete is. It can be mixed, but the line has to be stopped, has to be cleaned before the pervious mix is um, created. No fines can get into it. So the truck has to be clean. Everything has to be very, very clean. They're not going to do that for one yard. So you are sort of tied in a little bit on the size of the project with those materials. Pavers and um, flex stones and other things, you, uh, you can get um, really useful smaller size too. So um, we have a poll here that is um, looking at permeable paving, bioretention, vegetated roofs. I have not worked with any of these LID uh, solutions and then uh, the no answer. So um, it looks like that drain garden is the most used, 11 out of 41. Um, it's not an official uh, definition, but because of the soil function between impermeable pavers and rain gardens are so close, I sometimes tell people to sort of think about 
um, permeable pavement as a larger, deeper rain garden, sometimes filled with rock and covered over with pavers. So um, if you work with rain gardens, permeable pavers are not that big of a jump. So we just went through the gravel. 10 inches of pea gravel. This is a pain on the back. I don't recommend you do this. This is in Russia and um, in um, St. Petersburg. Beautiful, there for centuries. They have no runoff from the site. Uh, you can imagine the maintenance cost. If you can lend a client like that, go for it. I think you have your niche. Um, you can use rocks actually to, uh, if you can see it here on this picture, to capture runoff right off of a rain chain. Note that we have a pipe in here to capture anything access and moving it out of here so that it doesn't end up in the pavement. Um, that flagstone um, there is actually set on a permeable um, base here up to this point because we also have a dry well back here that captures some water and then everything is captured into an overflow pipe and moved down to the bottom of that bluff. We are not infiltrating anything 100 feet or closer to that bluff, it's steep slope. You can also, uh, this patio here is sitting on um, a permeable paver base. You can also create some very easy um, looking areas, but again, it's a deeper area. This is here a rain garden. So this is an LID site, and that's what I was talking about when I said that our sites don't have to look that different in the end when it comes to a result, but it functions very differently. When I talk to people, uh, homeowners and, um, and site uh, managers, I tell them that in the 21st century, any square inch of yard, garden, or parking lot space is called to function as a stormwater facility, as an air cleaner, as an energy and water use reducer, and if possible, uh, a food security stabilizer. That's a lot of requirements from a site, and we call these places gardens, yards, and parking lot strips. Retooling, there is definitely some retooling, um, if nothing else, than knowledge. So I recommend that if you are not um, up to date yet on these uh, subjects to quite a detail, you take more courses. Uh, you can become a rain vice contractor and take their con uh, training in Seattle. It's a, fair, a fast course, but it will teach a lot, you a lot about, about rain gardens and cisterns, uh, other LID solutions. Advanced Community College always offers courses. There is uh, WSNLA and VOLP programs, and the Department of Ecology is putting that training. Cascadia is organizing. Uh, several programs that are coming up. So pick the stuff that matches your um, time and time commitment and the availability and uh, take those courses. You actually may need new tools too for um, concrete. You saw what you have to use. They are very different tools than typical concrete installation. And um, it's just something that uh, be prepared for. Uh, it's it's always worth it, I think, in the end. And you know, um, when I talk about these things, it's not just a business decision for me. I have kids, and I want those kids to have a planet to live on. And I feel that it's my responsibility to do my best every single day that I'm improving the environment rather than abusing it. So um, New tools are actually material dependent, so with concrete you will need it, skills, training, certification. So again, you will not be able to do purviews concrete if you don't, are not certified. Pavers, a lot of the paver systems require that you take uh, certain training and certification, so that, that's something to look into. Uh, the rain vice program will not let you do anything unless you took their uh, certification and so forth. Uh, a lot of the specs now, uh, on designs come out and um, require that people who uh, install those projects are certified in certain fields and have some experience. So it's good to uh, gather those ahead of time so that you can bid on those projects. The value of LID, this is actually in the Seattle Public Utilities um, publications, is um, really less 
expensive, more value than the traditional um, development. 50-year maintenance plan, I don't know if any of you had to put those together for a client yet, but cities always look at it. And um, it's about 60% um, of the cost than uh, traditional per block. That's a huge saving to taxpayers. It's also an aesthetic thing. It's beautiful. You can make it anything um, as, as your creativity um, allows. Property sales, most people nowadays heard something about green development, and that's a sales tool. Property sells with those um, amendments. Uh, it it uh, brings in businesses that are like-minded, brings in people who are like-minded, so it creates communities that are uh, different and it can be hugely cost-saving. Our job as professionals, I really believe, is redefining beauty and training our clients in that. It, it goes back to, for example, the turf um, block. It's okay to have clover. It's just as beautiful as turf. And in fact, in many times, it is more beautiful in the Northwest. But we have to train people about that. We have to steer them away from, from the non-sustainable solutions. Uh, talk about improving habitat and, um, and assisting wildlife. Uh, increased function, I already told you about all the different things a site has to do in the 21st century, and these uh, solutions actually enable the site to function as such. So when I um, switched over and um, moved into the LID, I did a lot of networking, but it's not just within our own uh, groups and communities. I network with and still do with engineers and suppliers and explore um, update my knowledge, constantly reassess the market out there, and um, I'm sort of just like a, um, a surfer on the, on the waves. There is no path out there that somebody already cut and I can uh, just walk down on. In many ways, you will be creating your own market, and um, I think that for, for those of us who are very involved with um, business right now, it's a, it's an, it's a nice challenge. It's, it's something that builds our, our skills. So um, for me, there is really no other option. Uh, I'm very passionate about this, but I also believe that it's a, it's a very good business decision. So um, it's paid off for me. We do have a poll, and um, we want to um, know if you think that it will be a big part of your business, or it will be growing part of your business, maybe modest, or you're not really thinking that you're going to move down on this path, or you're not sure. So please answer those uh, questions now, and then we're going to show what we see. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. So, okay, so we are at the, at the last slide, and... Um, as soon as your answers are received, we are going to show you that. And we'll, we'll move into a few questions that people have. So um, one person has asked, how do you convert a site that has had impervious concrete to a pervious concrete site? A lot of these permeable pavements, not just concrete, but pavers and asphalt as well, and, and some of the and the turf and the grid gridded systems that Sophia mentioned, can be retrofitted to an existing site. Um, uh, the, the, obviously, if you have a let's say we're looking at a parking lot, uh, and we want to and we uh, are either adding to a building and we need to put some impervious or per permeable material down to to be able to add to our building or structure. It's, it's, uh, the concrete can be removed, excavated. Tests can then be done on the soil beneath to see if, uh, if we can infiltrate. And, uh, and uh, again, depending on the scale of the project, engineering and resources may be needed to, uh, to examine that and look at that. But it's, 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 uh, it's very easy. It's excavation, putting in the right amount of material, uh, the uh, aggregates and then resurfacing in the appropriate material, whether it be concrete, pervious concrete, uh, porous asphalt, or uh, permeable interlocking papers. Have you found in your experience that um, some sites, once you've removed the existing pavement layer, are too compacted to put in pervious pavement? You've got to be careful of that, just yeah. like you would in, in new construction. Yeah. 
you see that, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to do a very thorough uh, infiltration test and sometimes even go deeper than your uh, sublayer will be on that pavement. Mm -hmm. And um, if it really has challenges with drainage, I always recommend that you do a very good overflow system in there. You have um, the water moving somewhere from there when the big storms are hitting. Start with the soil classification maps and your county extension yeah. and, and those sources to find out you know what is it? What are you likely? What soil are you, in the geology are you likely to run into underneath your uh, project? And then you can uh, make a decision if you if you want to excavate or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then another question we have, and I'm not sure if you guys have this on the top of your head, but um, can you provide a range of installed costs per square foot for different permeable surface options? Asphalt versus pavers versus concrete. Asphalt actually has gone down quite a bit. So right now, um, last year it was around a dollar eighty to two fifty a square feet. And keep in mind that it's large scale, forty tons is the minimum. Concrete can be um, still um, a little more expensive, larger scale. It's uh, now down to about three dollars and fifty cents. However, I also want to caution you that as gas prices will be going up on and off, prices will fluctuate. So don't take this as uh, you heard it, and so that's how much it has to be. But that's that's the large scale industrial cost last year. Concrete, so I went around three to three fifty, and then all the way up to seven dollars a square foot or more. If it's very small, like what you saw in colored, like the colorful blue path that you saw, that can be uh, still up in the eight or nine dollars a square foot range. It's less expensive. Um, than some of the fancy pavers, but the industrial uh, permeable pavers, I think, uh, compare very well with that. So we can talk about that. The zero pave uh, is one of the most expensive solutions if that's the only paver that you want to use. The pavers themselves run um, 11 to $13 a square foot as of last year. Uh, and then you still have to do the excavation in the base and also you can be running into the $20, $25 a square feet on those. I, I agree with Sophia. The, the, the asphalt is typically the least expensive, but it has the most limitations as far as uh, adaptability to a variety of projects. Uh, and and I, I've seen a wide range too with asphalt uh, in the in the three dollar a square foot range up to seven dollars a square foot. So mm -hmm. so it really depends on the project. Um, so so realize that these comparisons are just kind of uh, ballpark estimates. They're not exact. You'd need to get estimates for a specific project. Uh, with pavers and concrete uh, and asphalt, if you have a windy path, that's going to cost you more than having a big open parking lot. So, so look at uh, your layout and your site conditions. Pervious concrete, porous, uh, pervious concrete, and permeable interlocking pavers are are pretty much uh, tied at at in that uh, six, seven, eight dollar a square foot range. Uh, and, and if we can use a, a um, uh, mechanical installation with the pavers. If we if we uh, if we use hand installation, pavers will typically run a little bit more. But then you have more variety and options as far as looks and that go to. Great. Um, another question we have is with an ex the extensive sub base on these systems, I would anticipate much more subsoil being um, removed from the site. Is this a problem to dispose of? What's what's typically done with that subsoil? Well, usually we add it into the cost, so that's part of the reason why it costs more than just putting in a regular concrete patio, for mm -hmm. example. But um, disposing them, you have to have a facility that accepts soil, and it's legally accepting. It's not somebody who says, oh, sure, just dump it in the back, but it's actually a facility that is licensed to take the soil, and there will be a charge. Uh, it will vary where you are, how far that facility is from you, um, but volumes you bring in, obviously the rate goes down or up if you bring in <laughs> a lot. Uh, it depends on what their conditions are. And if you hauling it yourself or they need to pick it up, if they uh, need to bring a container for you, um, and is it very rocky or it's more sand, it will all be depending on on the, on the same thing with any excavation. So. Um, Sometimes if you can use that soil somewhere on the site, it can save you a lot of money. So building berms with that and 
using it as the base for some new uh, areas that you then going to amend with implement a compost for plants, it's a, always a good idea. Mm -hmm. And, and in some instances on streets and other, other heavy traffic pavements, you're going to need a thicker base anyway for a typical asphalt design. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to need a, you're going to need some structure there. So, so uh, we're talking, a, uh, most of the designs I see around here for pavers are running anywhere from 8 to 12 inches of the reservoir course and then 5 inches of the, of the paver and a 4 inch choke course. So you can get in the 18, 19, 20 inch depth and have a very functional pavement. Remember, the entire surface of the pavement is, is gonna, going to uh, help uh, infiltrate water and get water in the system. So you've got a, a big reservoir with just uh, 12 inches of reservoir course beneath. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Um, oh, and one person asks if there are any um, pervious installations in North Everett to visit. Do you either? Yes, we actually have one of the only ones in the west um, of the Mississippi of filter paves, which we didn't talk about. It's at um, the Botanical Garden in Everett, and it is one um, really beautiful system. It's um, recycled glass that's stumbled and glued in it to part uh, adhesive system. There are challenges to the uh, placement. You have about three to five minutes to play with it once it's um, mixed with the glue. It requires a special machinery that costs about $24,000. So the company who um, installed this demonstration project chose not to buy the machine. The result is, however, beautiful. If you are interested in it, I guarantee you, you will have a really good business very quick because uh, it's just a beautiful system. So yes, we have that. We also have some um, previous uh, concrete installations. Uh, well, in Everett now, um, we have we actually have um, in the Snohomish um, County city, uh, County um, headquarters and right by uh, City Hall for Everett. It's um, percrete, which is a, a previous concrete. Uh, sort of material. We have, um, we have in Arlington, we have the Smoky Point really large asphalt. We have also the Tulalip tribes have previous concrete installations in their big areas around the casino and uh, the outlet mall. We have um, oh, lots of homeowners, but those are not really um, something where you can walk up to and just look unless it's in the driveway. And so, um, there's a couple of uh, public uh, permeable paver projects that you can look at. One is the Marysville Park and Ride yes. off of uh, off of I-5 in, in Marysville. Um, it's on the uh, um, northeast side of that uh, that intersection on I-5. Um, I drove by there the other day and noticed there was a little bit of ponding. It looks like it's uh, time to, to vacuum sweep that that lot, but uh, but it's still functioning and uh, and working well. That project actually won its Ash Avenue Park and Ride is the name of the facility. It actually won an engineering award because there was use of, uh, of soil mixtures uh, beneath the uh, permeable pavement that help uh, treat the uh, stormwater as well as provide flow control. Then the other one that comes to mind, uh, it's not in North Everett, but it's in Muckleteo yeah, at the, uh, at the um, um, Lighthouse Park there in Muckleteo yeah. is, a, is a, a, the, the uh, Ash Avenue Park and Ride was almost 10 years ago now, uh, eight years ago, eight to 10 years ago, and the uh, the Muckleteo was only a couple of years ago, and it's uh, it's using a, 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 a great paver design and a little circle roundabout and parking areas there at the Lighthouse Park in Muckleteo. Yeah, and the Muckleteo City Hall has permeable uh, concrete parking lot too, so you can see that also. So and those the are ice creamery, isn't there? Oh, that's in Maltby. Oh, that's uh, not Maltby. in Everett, but the ice cream, the Snoqualmie Ice Cream Factory yeah. has a really nicely functioning big pervious concrete. And uh, if you're there, make sure that you have ice cream too, yeah. because now they um really growing a lot of the ingredients in their mini farm that we installed behind their facility last year. Yeah. And the, uh, one of the participants is uh, letting us know that there is um, an old installation on Whitby Island at Bayview Corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that yeah, Woodby Island has actually some. I think that's public, but then also they have a lot of residential 
installation. And, uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned, it, we uh, and if at the end uh, of the, my presentation, you had my email there. Feel free if I, I can email you a list of, of paver projects all around the Puget Sound area if anybody's mm -hmm. interested. So yeah, great. So, uh, so there's lots. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sophia and Rick. Um, this was a great presentation, and thank you to all you participants out there that uh, joined us, uh, and and thank you for um, your patience with our few technical difficulties. And with that, uh, this is the end of our webinar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.